Hi, and thank you for joining us for session number two of the Spring 2022 GPS Symposium. So uh, for those of you that didn't get the message on the way in, the session is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please keep your camera off. As part of the GES deg degree requirement, every GES student must conduct a faculty mentored research experience, which involves writing a thesis, publicly presenting their findings, along with taking questions from an audience. So that's what we're doing here today. Today, uh, this year, this spring, this semester, we have a record number of students, GS students presenting. Uh, so we have 15 students this semester, which is up from the maximum before of 10 in 2018. As a result of that, we are doing it in two sections. So we had section this morning with eight presenters and then this afternoon session with seven presenters. Each student has been allocated 15 minutes. During that time, they'll be briefly introduced by their faculty member, mentor rather, sorry. Uh, they will give their presentation and they will answer questions from the audience. At the end of each present presentation, you can unmute and briefly congratulate the presenter. Otherwise, please be muted and hold all chat comments until after the presenter has finished their presentation. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion, so either raise your hand under the reactions, type your question into the chat, or um, if there aren't you know, a huge number, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, so our first presenter today will be introduced by his mentor, Xuan Xuan, Dr. Xuan Xuan Xuan, sorry, uh, from the Urban and Region Planning Department. Hi everyone, thanks for joining the um, presentation today. Um, so I would like to introduce Ding Yi Liu, who's my uh, men mentor, uh, mentee. Um, so Ding Yi is a combined bachelor and master program student of the Global Environmental Science and Master of the Urban and Regional Planning Department at uh, UH Manoa. He also pursued a GIS certificate. His interest includes climate change adaptation, transportation planning, and environmental planning. His work evaluates the impact of uh, environmental changes on the coastal communities um, using spatial analysis techniques. During his time at the G uh, GES, he received the fundings from undergraduate research opportunities for three sequential semesters. He also worked as a co-author for a research paper and presented the findings at the annual transportation research board meeting in Washington DC this past January. It has been a great pleasure to working with him. So without further ado, Dean, I will let you take it over. Thank you very much, Dr. Sun. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Ding Yi. And uh, thank everyone to be here today. And now I'm going to pre uh, present my uh, thesis. My thesis is impact of sea level rise on aging populations accessibility to essential services in Honolulu, Hawaii. At first, I would like to give you all some background of my research. So at first, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, population growth. There's a two population growth pattern I focus on in this study. At the first, the first one is the population growth in low elevation. Uh, and also the population growth in low elevation contains a large number of the older residents. Uh, the second one I'd like to talk about is uh, climate change. So, uh, one major factor of uh, climate change is uh, uh, sea level rise. According to the IPCC's projection, uh, there will be a 1.1 feet sea level rise in year 2050 and uh, 3.2 feet sea level rise in the year 2100. And also climate change also brings a lot of other uh, impacts. 
such as more frequent uh, hurricanes, tsunamis, uh, and uh, other extreme weather conditions. So uh, here is a two graphs to help you uh, visualize the, how the coastal zone population change. So if you see the night blue uh, bars shows how the low elevation coastal community population growing uh, from 2000 years to uh, 2060 globally. And uh, the graph on the uh, right hand side is how the uh, sea level rise will rise in the future uh, 80 years. And then I'd like to uh, talk about of, uh, how the older populations and their transportation uh, opportunities. At first, the older population, they have less transportation options because they have to give up driving. So what's the consequence of their uh, travel difficulties? So they will feel social exclusion as they cannot go to everywhere they want. Uh, also, as we just talked, the climate change driving hazards will increase the disruptions of the transportation system that will make the uh, older population even harder to uh, get to the place they want to go. Okay, next we move to a very important um, uh, concept in this study is accessibility. The accessibility can be uh, defined as the ease of reaching destinations. And in the past uh, decades, there are many accessibility metrics have been developed. developed it. Uh, in this uh, study, we particularly focus on the accessibility to the essential services. Why I uh, focus on the older population accessibility to the essential services is because older population, they have high need to uh, go to the essential services such as uh, uh, hospital and the clinics. They also have, uh, may have a frequent uh, requirement uh, to um, ask for the help from the fire station and, or the pony station. So uh, the next I would like to talk about the transportation infrastructures. It, it might under, uh, under the climate change uh, scenarios, uh, the flooding may interrupt the transportation infrastructures. And uh, uh, regarding the signal rise, we just talked about the impact of the signal rise to the transportation infrastructures is uh, permanent. And, uh, signal rise will lift the water table and damage the road beds. And uh, it will also affect um, uh, the transportation network and uh, cut the roads and uh, make the uh, road close. So this is uh, like a photo of uh, what ha what's happening in Hawaii now, the signal rise erodes to the road bed. Okay, uh, the next is uh, the method I use. So at first I collect some data and uh, I project the population in uh, 2050 in each uh, coastal communities in Hawaii. And then I use network analysis in ArcGIS and then I uh, have accessibility measurement. So this is a, a data resource. I got um, the first, I have a transportation analysis zone TAZ as a small geographical uh, community area. And then I have street networks and signal rise exposure uh, in different uh, uh, signal rise scenarios. Uh, also the essential services. Uh, I have uh, grocery stores, hospital and clinics, fire stations and the police stations for the essential services at Nanosense. Then how, how do I project the uh, population? I use a very popular uh, population projection method called the uh, cohort change ratio, CCR. The CCR projects the population by uh, age uh, from the time T to time T plus K using um, the, the function in the, in the left upper and computed from the two most recent census data. And those two most recent, uh, recent census Develop the ratio, which is the NCCRX, and we apply the ratio to the cohorts of the uh, lunch year population to make um, to to move them into the future. So it can repeat the uh, um, infinity times to project the population in the future decades. 
And then I use ArcGIS Pro for or, uh, oriented and destination network analysis and accessibility measurement. So I talk about accessibility measurement, I use the Haston Integral Accessibility Index. So basically this uh, um, accessibility measurement is computed by the uh, opportunity to each, to the essential services in each um, TAs over the, the all opportunities to access to uh, the essential services in all Honolulu. So here's the, what I'm uh, what what I'm uh, found. So uh, uh, there's so the 1.1 feet center rise will in, uh, will in not it to one grocery store is uh, compared with the 3.2 feet center rise. There's more essential services will be inundated and uh, uh, 4.3 percent of road will inundated by uh, 3.2 feet center rise. So this is how accessibility will change uh, um, to essential services in different uh, scenarios. scenarios. Uh, this is, uh, I'll give you a series of uh, maps to show how the accessibility uh, will change if the, if the those TA days goes lighter, that means less uh, accessibility. And if this goes darker, uh, that means they have a uh, greater accessibility. So if, as you can see, as uh, the scenario rising, uh, the overall the map goes lighter. And uh, some areas that even just goes to white, that, which means there's no accessibility. And here is a series of uh, bi uh, red map of 65 plus uh, years old population, uh, the accessibility reduction to essential services. So as again, if, sorry, uh, if it goes uh, darker, it means they have higher population and higher reduction. And if it goes lighter, that means they have less, less population and uh, uh, less reduction. So again, you can see a lot of coastal communities, they have a high population and a high accessibility uh, reduction. So here's a conclusion. Signal accessibility to essential service services will be significantly affected in the coming decades. So basically, it will happen. Uh, 1.1 feet signal rise according to the projection of IPCC. It will happen in uh, the year uh, 2050. So it, it will happen very shortly. And some TSAs will lose accessibility to due to the signal rise if the coastal roads remain status quo. And uh, 3.2 feet standard rise will cause even more significant uh, uh, reduction in older population accessibility, as the map showed. So how 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 can we uh, face to the situation? At first, we can leave the coastal road road path, and the second is re relocated the residents, and the third one is relocated essential services. Uh, so considering the relocation, uh, there are a lot of challenges to the relocation. And first is uh, the strong emo emotional bond of the olders to uh, they have they have lived in uh, the community for a long time, so they probably they don't want to move out. And also they enjoy the, the charming climate and the scenarios in the coastal areas. And for those people who live in the safe zones, they probably they don't want uh, a lot of a large group of people just to move in in a very short time. They uh, for the people who live in the safe, safe zones, they might have a uh, uh, concern of their safety. And um, yeah. And, but we can learn some lessons from successful, successful cases. Uh, an interdisciplinary team, an appropriate assessment tool, and uh, the environment of the receiving facility are very helpful for the relocation. However, the more research should uh, are needed. So uh, just in a word, uh, the study highlights that some coastal TAs will no longer have accessibility to the internet services in 30 years. And for communities at risk of being cut off, measures of lifting coastal roads or relocation should be taken as soon as possible. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sen for her awesome mentoring, even she's in sabbatical this semester, but she always 
uh, there to help me. And uh, I also would like to thank your Europe for the fundings and the owners program and uh, Dr. Gina Skimmer for the reviewing this project. And I thank everyone in GES for the, this journey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? So in your second to last slide, I think it was, uh, you commented that you know, one of the problems was you know, people will get emotionally attached to areas. Um, seeing the, you know, the most, uh, the greatest effects of sea level rise will not be until you know, your generation uh, seniors. Is there something that you, know, you could do differently or your generation would, could do differently than previous generations to try and minimize the effect? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, for our generation, yeah, we should uh, prepare ourselves like if, we, uh, I mean, uh, when I have enough money to buy a house, I probably won't consider the housing, the elevation areas. But I mean, actually everything, I mean, the 1.1 feet rise, as we discussed, will happen in the year 2050. So it's just a 30 years, it's not my generation, it's probably, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not my generation. Yeah, that would be my yeah. generation, but <laughs> the two or three foot rise will be closer yeah. to the end of the century and that will be your generation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you our, very much. Our next presenter will be introduced by Dr. Jeff Drazen from the Oceanography Department. Hi, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sophia Long, and I want to also acknowledge her, her other mentors. It wasn't just me, but Kirsten Leong and Danica uh, Piver from NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, Sophia has taken a really interesting path in her studies. She actually started uh, college in film school in New York and uh, was very interested in pursuing that for a career. Um, and she hadn't really thought a whole lot about research before, she tells me, um, but she had a change of heart when she was in film school and decided that she wanted to do something that would be more inf impactful and help the environment. And she had a lot of lawyers in the family and she also had a neighbor who had gone to UH. And so she decided to come here and she joined the GES program in 2019. And her thought was that she would uh, find her way into environmental policy or environmental law. And she has excelled in our, our GAS program. She's done a marvelous job. And uh, as you'll see today, she has stuck to her idea of pursuing environmental law and policy. She's gonna to present to us some work that she's done investigating how policy has treated non-commercial fishing across the United States. All right, thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Sophia Long and today I'm going to be talking about my thesis project that was looking at how non-commercial fishing is defined throughout United States fishery policy. So a little bit of background on the project. There is currently a study being conducted at NOAA that is looking at how non-commercial fishing is discussed in both policy and peer-reviewed literature throughout the country with the hopes that an enhanced social science perspective can be more inclusive in this wide variety of fishing discussions that is in policy hopefully to be applied to a possible reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which is the current guiding regulation for fishery policy in the United States. So why is this important? The Magnuson-Stevens Act currently only defines recreational fishing and commercial fishing. And under those two definitions, a lot of other elements and fishing related activities are excluded, such as cultural and social elements that are incredibly important parts of any fishing related activity. 
non-commercial fishing is now kind of considered more of an accurate term, but there's still no concrete understanding of what exactly it is and what is involved in non-commercial fishing. So the hope with this project is to highlight some of those differences and kind of see where policy can be updated to be more inclusive of these social science perspectives and social elements that come with fishing. So what is social science with respect to fishing? Essentially, it examines how humans relate to fishing and fishing related activities, which is a huge part of fishing and fishing as an experience as a whole. But unfortunately, the United States has been historically inconsistent with including social science research into fisheries management and fisheries policy. Economics are often the only type of included social science, but that tends to monetize the human experience, focusing largely on quantitative data analysis. And that needs to be updated and changed because again, there are so many elements of social interaction and cultural importance that are associated with fishing. So my project is a small piece of this larger work that's being conducted at NOAA. I looked at only policy documents and only in three out of NOAA's five management regions. I studied policy in Alaska, the West Coast, and the Pacific Islands region, as well as some national documents as well. For my analysis and data collection, I worked in a software called MaxQDA. This is a screenshot of the homepage that I'm going to walk you through some of my methods for conducting this work. So first, I'll draw your attention to the upper left corner. You can see all of the documents in the different folders of each region that I worked with. Documents were submitted to me if they brought up non-commercial phishing in some, some way or in some language within the text. And then I analyzed them in more detail using this code system that was also provided to me by NOAA. As I went through this process, I manipulated the code a little bit to be uh, appropriate for the data that I was working with. But you can see the activity benefits motivation code category is expanded to show some of the sub codes within that cultural practices, food security, et cetera. And the term use category is small, but it's all the way on the bottom in blue. And that is essentially any of the different types of non-commercial phishing that could be brought up in a document. Due to the constraints of this project, I focus just on analysis of at the activity category and the term used category. So this is one example of a segment of text that I coded to look for patterns in. This is the definition of subsistence fishing in the fishery ecosystem plan for American Samoa. It defines subsistence fishing as fishing to obtain food for personal and or community use rather than for profit sales or recreation. So when reading that definition, I attach the codes subsistence fishing, not monetary purposes, giveaway share, food security, and food consumption all of which are brought up in the text itself. So this is essentially just a quick example of what I was doing with all of the documents and all of the times that any of the terms related to non-commercial fishing were brought up. So this is a figure that I'm going to refer to again later in the presentation, but for now, let's just call it the consolidation figure. All of the uh, colors represent different activity codes that we just previously looked at in the Max QDA screenshot. This is showing the relationship between sport fish fishing and recreational fishing. You can see there's a large crossover in the language that's being discussed within the context of sport fish fishing and recreational fishing. So I made the decision to consolidate these two codes or these two types of fishing into one code that is now just called recreational fishing. And I did this so that I could have larger sample sizes as well as be able to see patterns in the data more clearly. I consolidated multiple other codes as well, but again, only if they had this co-occurrence happening more than 50% of the time. So now getting into some of my results. Initially, first I'll draw your attention to the banner on the left that shows the high variability in the differences between the documents that were provided to me uh, for each region. So you can see the Pacific Islands has the highest number of documents, whereas the West Coast has the least with only three documents and under 300 pages. So there's a lot of variability that I had to combat as I was working with this data through my analysis process. This table on the right is showing the Pacific Islands region, Alaska, West Coast, and National, and all of the non-commercial fishing terms that they bring up. The numbers are representative of the frequency of times that that type of fishing is discussed, and the red line shows all of the types of fishing that are unique to the Pacific Islands region. You can see that there is a large diversity of terms in the Pacific Islands as compared to Alaska, the West Coast, and National. So this is incredibly important Sophia? to understand. Yes? Sorry, it doesn't look like there. Your slide just advanced. It wasn't advancing. Oh, is it stuck on? Can everyone see? Yes. Okay. You're good now. 
Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so again, you can see this diversity in the Pacific Islands region, and that could have to do with a variety of different things. The first of which being that the Pacific Islands region has been spearheading this policy inclusivity more than the other regions of Alaska and the West Coast. Additionally, the Pacific Islands is a very unique geographical region. So there are multiple islands that make up the region um, with different cultures and different understandings of fish, even different languages. So that is well reasonably incorporated into the policy. The next figure I'm going to talk about is again looking at term used, but this is just the most frequently coded term. So subsistence, recreational, and traditional were the most commonly coded terms throughout all of the regions. This data is standardized by the number of page to combat some of that high variability between the regions. You can see the Pacific Islands region has a very diverse and well-rounded set of term use with recreational fishing being the highest, whereas the West Coast and National also have recreational fishing the highest, but it's much higher based on the page number than the Pacific Islands. The West Coast and National have very similar distributions, and I think that largely has to do with the reality that um, there is historical lack of inclusion within this region in federal policy. Back hundreds of years when policy was first being written, the indigenous perspectives and Native American perspectives were not really incorporated into the language and the social element that comes with fishing. So that, I think that language is still kind of incorporated into federal policy today. Although that was happening in Alaska as well, Alaska is unique because it has hundreds of federally recognized tribes that impact the policy. And it is also the state that relies most heavily on food that is caught in the wild or subsistence hunting, or in this case, fishing. You can see that language surrounding subsistence fishing is reflected in the policy quite well, with the green being incredibly higher than the other two types of fishing. This figure is set up the same way as the previous one, except now it is looking at the most frequently coded activity categories. Overall, there's a relatively equal distribution, nothing too striking between all of the regions, but I wanna draw your attention to this barter and trade category in the Pacific Islands and the West Coast that's very low, but it's quite high in Alaska and the national documents. And I think that has to do with the reality that the fishing industry in Alaska is tremendously important and prevalent, whether I know this project is talking about non-commercial fishing, but there are still commercial aspects of trade and the importance of the economic reality of fishing in Alaska. And I think that makes sense as to why barter and trade is discussed more than say the social element of fishing. Similarly, in national economics are very important to the federal government. So it makes sense that barter and trade are brought up more than say, again, recreation or social elements of fishing. So the final piece of results I'm going to share with you today is co-occurrence and essentially what co-occurrence can teach us in how we can use it to update policy documents and definitions. So this co-occurrence was created basically it means, for example, subsistence fishing and food security related codes co-occurred together, aka came up in the same segment of text 19 times, recreational fishing and recreation leisure came up 17 times, so these are all kind of expected co-occurrences, but what's interesting is you look at subsistence fishing and cultural practices and knowledge that co-occurred almost as many times as food security and subsistence fishing did, and this essentially means that there is a large cultural element to subsistence fishing that is being discussed in the policy, and the policy that that is being discussed most frequently in is Alaska. Eight out of the 17 documents um, eight out of the 17 co-occurrences were in Alaska, again, signifying that there is an extreme cultural element and a cultural importance to subsistence fishing. That is reflected in the definition for subsistence use and subsistence fishing within Alaska. You can see this definition is quite extensive. It talks about more than just eating, consuming, or selling fish. There are many elements incorporated into it, traditional customary uses of these resources and things. When you compare that to the definition, the federal definition in the MSA for recreational fishing that simply says fishing for sport or pleasure, you can see how the recreational fishing definition could afford to be updated because we know that recreational fishing is far more than just fishing for sport or pleasure. That is when I will refer us back to this figure that we looked at earlier, except now just focusing on the terms surrounding recreational fishing. Commercial motive, food consumption, well-being, economic survival, cultural identity, all of these things are being discussed within the context of recreational fishing, but they are not being reflected in the definition. So this is hopefully a tool that we can use to apply to possible updating of these terms in the Magnuson-Stevens Act and other fishery policy around the country. 
So some conclusions to summarize, the Pacific Islands region is spearheading policy language diversity in general and creating a place for social science that hopefully other regions can follow. Alaska has extensive subsistence law and detailed definitions about more than just consuming the fish or selling it, which is setting a standard for inclusivity and social science understandings of culture and uh, the social element to fishing that can hopefully be applied again to other definitions of non-commercial fishing. The West Coast has limited language and generally mimics national policy, and national policy is vague, vague and outdated, so this ultimately results in little to no protection for any cultural practices or people and communities that heavily rely on fish. Co-occurrence can be the tool to highlight these discrepancies between the definition and the context in which the type of fishing is being discussed that can hopefully be applied to a reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Act and other federal policy and regional policy with an acknowledged social science perspective that will ultimately help to create a better understanding of the importance and the cultural significance of fish and fishing. This research has already been presented at the SFAA and is going to be included in the final report that is being uh, written and conducted at NOAA by two of my mentors, Dr. Danica Kleiber and Dr. Kirsten Leong. I wanna thank you so much for your assistance on this project. In addition, Dr. Drazen, thank you for mentoring me through this whole uh, thesis adventure. Um, additionally, thank you to NOAA and Jaimar for the resources and opportunity, as well as the multitude of professors at SOAS that have assisted me in not only finding a project and keeping me on track with these responsibilities, but all other GES related requirements. Thank you so much. Any questions? Woohoo! Good job! Hey. Hi, I actually have a question if I can speak. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you mentioned that Alaska has a lot of cultural fishing, mm -hmm. um, with Hawaii having a lot of cultural ties and roots. Do you think Hawaii will ever become as similar as Alaska in terms of cultural fishing? And then if so, how? Yeah, I think the way that um, Alaska is unique, again, because it has what's called federal subsistence law, which is essentially it outlines um, in the legal uh, standings in Alaska, essentially what can be done to protect and uh, enhance people's rights to take their own, gather their own resources and food. So I think we don't have that in Hawaii. So I think that's an interesting way to compare the two. But I think uh, the goal is definitely for Hawaii to be even more inclusive. We talk a lot about fishing definitions, but um, the actual definitions themselves need to be updated. So yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways that um, it can be updated in general, and even Alaska could update its other definitions of recreational fishing and traditional fishing. We have time for one more question. Okay, not great job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next presenter will be introduced by Dr. Craig Nelson, also from Oceanography. Thanks, Glenn. So I'm here today to introduce uh, my GES student, Raina McClintock, who came to us from Colorado. Um, she, when she was in high school, she learned to scuba dive and she was already doing coral reef conservation work when she decided to come here to SOEST after looking at many institutions. So I think it speaks a lot to Raina that she came here knowing she wanted to be a coral reef scientist, but when she first got looped into her first project, it was to work on the Alawai Canal. And that was how we got introduced to each other uh, when she started working on Brian Glazer's Alawai Canal project. And Raina has worked on about five independent projects while she's been here. The one that she's gonna present today will be one that she just started a few months ago, uh, which also speaks to her amazing acuity and ability to um, do lots of different things. And she was a pleasure to have in lab, and I'm super excited to see her off, go off and do great things. So take it away, Raina. Thank you so much, Peg.
Thank you all for coming to this presentation today. Uh, my thesis focused on characterizing the effect of submarine groundwater discharge on coral reef planktonic microbial communities of Moorea, French Polynesia. Here's just a brief outline of what I'll cover in this presentation um, from the introduction to the discussion and conclusions. So what is submarine groundwater discharge? This is a fresh or a, a natural phenomenon in which fresh groundwater is released through cracks in the benthos. Uh, it's characterized by low salinity, uh, lower pH, and high nutrient conditions. It's also been known to be affected by tidal cycles, and it is a potential transporter of anthropogenic pollutants. This is an extremely common phenomenon found throughout the Pacific. Um, you can see it in Hawaii. If you are walking uh, along the coast and you see shimmery, almost blurry water that is much colder than the surrounding water, uh, you might have found a point of submarine groundwater discharge. Because submarine groundwater discharge is um, characterized by high nutrients, it's important to understand how these nutrients affect coral reef ecosystems. <clears throat> so are these a net positive or a net negative? And the answer is it depends on the environment and the combinations of stressors coalescing in that environment. Corals are animals that live within oligotrophic or low nutrient environments, so they require nutrient input to sustain their organisms. Some of the positives found of coral of nutrient enrichment on coral reefs um, is that it enhances the coral growth rates and it can increase thermal performance. But corals aren't the only things that require nutrients to survive. So some of the negatives found from nutrient enrichment are that it incites algal blooms that outcompete corals for space and light, can decrease net community calcification rates, it can disrupt photosynthesis, photosynthesis rates, it can make the relationship with the Simaginaceae parasitic instead of symbiotic, as well as disrupt the microbial community, selecting for pathogens and decreased diversity. So corals are very unique organisms and microbes uh, play an essential role within corals. Um, corals have a hollow biont, which is made up of microbes like bacteria, archaea, fungi, viruses, and other proteins that recycle nutrients over the reef. So you can see in this figure on the right, the Symbiodinaceae is exchanging carbon and sulfur, while there's other bacteria there that are exchanging carbon, nitrate, phosphorus, and sulfate. Other than nutrient cycling, the main functions of microbes on reef include um, providing immune responses and helping with competition of other organisms on the benthos. And it's possible that this holobiont symbiosis is being disrupted by environmental changes like decreasing salinity and changes in temperature that are characteristics of submarine groundwater discharge. So some of the purpose of this research is to study SGD as a source of pollution on reefs. Cesspools are common wastewater systems that you can find uh, throughout Pacific Islands. And they're basically cement structures underneath a residential community that hold wastewater. And they usually have empty bottoms. Um, and the, uh, the wastewater can seep into the sediment surrounding that cesspool. If the groundwater level reaches that sediment, it can become con contaminated with the nutrients and pathogens from that wastewater and then be discharged directly onto a coastal reef ecosystem by submarine groundwater discharge. So this can disturb um, uh, the community metabolism, affect the coral growth rate, and change community compositions. This is also important because rising sea levels from climate change and increased temperatures will mean rising water table. So groundwater will be reaching these uh, sediments surrounding cesspools and becoming contaminated more frequently within the coming years. The central questions of this research are what are the tidal dynamics of submarine groundwater discharge? How does submarine groundwater discharge affect the microbial community structure? And is there potential groundwater contamination identified by microbial indicators? This research was conducted in Moorea, French Polynesia, which is just a ferry ride away from Tahiti. Two locations where a seep of submarine groundwater discharge were identified, known as Cabral in the north and Verari just south of that site. 
These were identified both by word of mouth from local community members who had the locations of springs and knew that there was submarine groundwater discharge at these locations and confirmed with in situ measurements of salinity and radon. At both of these locations, 20 sites were set up where a water sample would be collected. At Cabral on the left, there is no predominant current. So the sites were just distributed, radiating out from the seepage point to capture a good gradient. On the right, Virari has a predominant northwestern current. So the sites were located downstream of the seep to catch that signal. Water samples were collected at the seep every three hours to get a high data resolution. And water samples were collected throughout the reef um, at high tide during the day, low tide during the day, high tide during the night, and low tide during the night. And from these samples, we were able to analyze the pH, salinity, to total alkalinity, temperature, nutrient content, microbial counts, and microbial community. And we were able to do this using auto samplers with a bag collection system. So we were able to program these auto samplers to collect a set volume of water at a specific time. So all of the samples were collected simultaneously throughout the reef. Our bag collection system entailed an inflow through the auto sampler to collect water off the benthos. That would then flow to this Y splitter into a fixed syringe to collect a five milliliter sample for microbial counts. Then the water would flow through a Sterevex filter that was 0.2 microns that would catch microbial DNA. And that filtered water would flow into these mylar bags that were then analyzed for nutrient compositions. The first result is, um, I'm showing you the correlations between the water level, salinity, log silicate concentrations, nitrate concentrations, and phosphate concentrations. As you can see, at this point, um, when the tide was lowest and the water level was lowest, that was coupled by a drop in salinity levels, meaning that fresh water was being output onto the reef um, at the seep at this time. And that was coupled by elevated silicate concentrations, elevated nitrate concentrations, and elevated phosphate concentrations. So this shows that the rate of SGD is being influenced by these tidal cycles with more submarine groundwater discharge influence at low tide. Next, I wanted to look at the spatial distribution of these nutrients throughout the reef using silicate as my proxy nutrient because it followed that tidal variation so closely. So these top two graphs, I'm showing you the Varari location. And the bottom two, I'm showing you crawl location um, with high tide on the left and uh, low tide on the right. Uh, the red is displaying high silicate concentrations with the blue displaying lower silicate concentrations. I did not include the seep um, during this analysis because the concentrations were so elevated that it was skewing my contours, but I added the seep after the analysis to show you where its location would be. As you can see at Virari, there is a higher nutrient output during the low tide when compared to high tide and the elevated concentrations appear to be coming from the direction of the seep and following the current patterns. At Cabral there is also a elevated silicate concentration during low tide while it's not as drastic it is still there. This could be um, because there's less current so those silicate particles are able to stick around in the environment longer at Cabral during that high tide scheme. Next, I wanted to explore the microbial DNA data. I did this with a multi-dimensional scaling plot to display my SGD-associated microbes. So a multi-dimensional scaling plot is an approach for graphically representing relationships between samples in multi-dimensional space. The reef samples are seen with a normal point and the seep samples are seen with a star. So there's obvious clustering with the reef samples or the seep samples being more similar to each other than the adjacent reef samples. I confirmed this by overlaying 50% um, confident ellipses on that MDS plot, showing that there's obvious grouping and the seep samples are different than the reef samples. Next, I performed hierarchical clustering um, of my microbial families and identified um, families that had higher um, relative abundance in the seep samples than in the adjacent reef samples. The major families inside this cluster included 
for Coldariaceae, Pseudomonodinaceae, and Archobacteriaceae that have all been previously associated with freshwater and wastewater habitats. The higher relative abundance of this SGD cluster is shown in red, um, and it being a overlaid on this MDS plot shows that it is accounting for a lot of the variability within this microbial data set um, and saying that SGD is influencing the microbial community. Next, I wanted to look at the presence of wastewater microbes um, that are uh, wastewater associated microbes. I did this by exploring the literature and finding um, a published list of microbes that have been associated with wastewater in the past and searching for them in my microbial data set. The genera that I found include Shigella, Vibrio, Aeromonas, Legionella, Mycobacterium, and Pseudomonas. I took the sum of these genera by site and displayed them um, uh, by their location. You can see the higher abundance again in red, lower abundance in blue. And while their presence is relatively low, um, only ranging from about zero to 1.6%, um, they appear to be coming from the seepage point. And in the case of Virari, they appear to be following, following that same current pattern that the nutrient concentrations did. So this makes me think that um, both the presence of the wastewater pathogens and the possible nutrients that could be coming from that wastewater might be anthropogenic in origin. So my final discussion and conclusions, the submarine groundwater discharge followed tidal cycles with more fresh water and elevated nutrient concentrations during low tide. There is a gradient of SGD influence over the reef that was consistent with the current. And there's an identifiable microbial community that was associated with the SGD and the microbes associated with wastewater contamination were present at both sites and appeared to be coming from that seep, leading us to believe that some of that nutrients and um, pathogens could be from uh, residential uh, communities. I'd like to thank all of the wonderful people who have helped me throughout this project. Uh, Dr. Craig Nelson has been such a fantastic mentor through all of these processes. All of the other students in the Nelson lab for teaching me lab techniques um, and bringing me in on their projects. I'd like to thank the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'd like to thank uh, the CSUN team for being fantastic collaborators on this project. I'd like to thank the Gump Station in Maorea for hosting this research and the NSF for the funding. Are there any questions? Nice job. Are there any questions? Uh, hello. <clears throat> uh, I do have a question. I saw someone who is from French Polynesia. Um, I would like to know if you have plans to present your findings to the locals and what do, we, what do you want to say to them in order to preserve their uh, resources at the moment? That's a great question. So this is ongoing research. Um, we've actually returned um, in March and have plans to continue going to these sites um, over the summer and continuing on. So once we're um, further confirming that there is wastewater contamination in these areas, then we can start uh, contacting both the Moraine government as well as local communities to see if they would be able to shift away from cesspools to other wastewater treatment um, facilities. And we also want to study uh, what the impacts are on the reef ecosystems to see if there is net negative at these locations and communicate that with um, the local residential community. Yeah. Okay, and to follow up, um, I would like to know if um, you noticed, uh, if you could extrapolate on your findings, because the area that you study is uh, fairly remote compared to where, for example, tourists and boats are located, uh, would the location and the input of these discharges uh, would change with geography? That's a great question. So yeah, these are very remote locations on a very healthy reef. So as I was saying earlier, that nutrient enrichment um, and its impact on coral ecosystems um, is very affected by a combination of stressors. So because this is in a rural environment with a healthier reef, the um, potential wastewater contamination might not be as negatively impacting this reef as it would in other um, geographical locations where there's more sedimentation, where there's more pollution from other sources and increased runoff um, and higher temperatures. 
So this definitely could change geographically. There have been studies um, on submarine groundwater discharge contamination in Hawaii. Um, they found similar, similar results with the tidal variation and um, potential contamination coming out and impacting reef ecosystems. So it's consistent through geography, but definitely impacted by the population um, of the reef you're studying. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. Our next presenter will be introduced by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Monahan, Monahan from the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. Hi, um, yeah, I'm very pleased to introduce Ashley. Um, she's actually been through three mentors here at DAR, so I very much appreciate her sticking with us and sticking with this project. Um, Ashley was born and raised in Kirkland, Washington, uh, where she's been working since COVID. Um, and she's looking forward to a number of things after graduating. Um, she's looking forward to continuing pursuing her passion of hiking. She loves hiking and she's excited to take her dog on some new adventures. Um, and then she's also going to be working at an outdoor education camp um, on Washington's coast this summer and also pouring beer at her favorite brewery, the Black Raven. Um, so yeah, I'll let Ashley introduce her project to you um, on validating an invasive species screening kit for Hawaii. Aloha everybody and thank you guys for coming today. As Lizzie introduced, I am Ashley and I will be presenting my thesis project research Validating an Invasive Species Screening Kit for Hoyt, Musculista Senhausia, and Pinctata Margaritifera. So before we can even start talking about invasive species, we have to mention the, or the native species present. So Hawaii has an abundance of native wildlife, and it is estimated that Hawaii supports more than 6,500 native marine taxa throughout the Hawaiian Islands. This wealth of native species is due to Hawaii's isolated geographic location. So Hawaii is over 3,000 miles, almost 4,000 miles away from Tokyo, and it's about 2,500 miles away from LA, and those are some of the closest land masses other than other Pacific islands. You can see the magnitude of how isolated it is on the map in the middle. The North Pacific is the most common shipping routes for Hawaii, and even those are quite far away. This geographic isolation leads to some unique species, but it also leaves these species susceptible to the adverse effects of invasive species as they have evolved without predators and they become vulnerable to disease. This isolation has impeded the ability for new species to colonize and it provided a lot of time for these native species to diversify. This geographic isolation also means Hawaii is almost entirely depending on shipping. So a lot of our shipping, most of our shipping comes from oceanic vessels. And this geographic isolation created a huge reliance on shipping goods, especially during these COVID times or what used to be COVID times. These vessels act as vectors for non-native species worldwide and especially around the Pacific Rim. The thicker arrows on this map I presented indicate heavier shipping traffic. And you can see a lot of it comes from the North Pacific or the um, over on the Pacific Rim by Japan. With more chances for invasion, there obviously is more reason for worry. And this is a worry because aquatic invasive species affect native areas in Hawaii. So it affects our biodiversity as we have over um, 300 invasive invertebrates as of right now. And a lot of these are relatively small and hard to monitor. On this pie chart, you can see a lot of these are, these are showing all our non-indigenous marine um, invertebrates and algae, and we have over 300 of them. And these native, or these invasive species negatively affect biodiversity because they compete with native species for resources such as food or space. And these, and these invasive species are typically more adaptable to varying water conditions and they push out these native species leading to a lack of biodiversity on the reef. Invasive species also affect the economy as invasions can destroy native ecosystems that the tourists come from all around to visit. All your friends and family, I'm sure, have wanted to come visit you guys here with the beautiful beaches. 
And tourists don't really wanna do that when the beaches are infested with algae, like the one up on the top right. Tourism brings around a billion dollars per year to Hawaii's economy. And so losing these beautiful sites will drastically affect our economy. It also affects infrastructure like boats and um, seawalls and stuff because um, removing them is quite expensive and time consuming and having them on there impedes their mechanical ability. And so now that we understand why invasive species are such a large problem in Hawaii, we know that we need to monitor and assess these. This graph on the right shows that um, over time, we have had a dramatic increase of invasive species, especially in the last 100 years when shipping has increased. To monitor and assess these, I used a couple of things in my project. So to monitor these, we used arms units and they were harbor monitoring projects. And to assess these, we used risk assessments and I used the one ASICS and I will speak more on these soon. So first to talk about harbor monitoring, the arms devices are quite widespread. It's not just Hawaii that uses them. Um, they're used all around the world and they are um, used to survey the wildlife in the area. So they are establishing a baseline of species present where they are. And when we pull them up, we can take the survey and see what the new invading species are. So this picture is showing a diver implementing an arms unit. It's PVC plates that are screwed together and they are set at the bottom of a reef. And organisms settle on these. And after a period of time, we scrape the plates and analyze and identify all the organisms. These um, plates are spaced at different widths to allow different um, microbiomes and different um, environments for different kinds of organisms. As far as deploying these devices, we deployed 20 arms units inside five harbors in 2018. We have four in the Nawiliwili Harbor in Kauai, we have four in Hilo Harbor, Kauai, four in Kahului Harbor, Maui, and four Barbers Point, Oahu, as well as four in Honolulu Harbor. These were put inside and outside the major reefs to assess the greatest variety of organisms. Retrieving these is a whole process. <laughs> so what we do when we retrieve them is we pull them up and we um, bring them into Bishop Museum for live on-site sorting. We worked very closely with the faculty and the um, postdocs at Bishop Museum to identify the vast array of species there and work on our methods. Our methods were adapted from the Smithsonian Protocol. And so we would scrape the plates and remove all the large organisms that we could see. And we would live sort on site for as long as possible. All other organisms were preserved in ethanol, like in that middle picture, preserved in 90% ethanol and then sorted at a later date. Organisms that are too small to see, we use a dissection microscope to identify them. And I had all this awesome data and I was wondering what the impact of these invasive species would be in the state of Hawaii. And so to figure out the impacts, you have to use risk assessments. So risk assessments are used in a variety of different subjects, but a risk assessment evaluates the uh, potential risk quite easily. So um, when we're talking about invasive species, it's in analyzing the risk of that particular species that it may pose to that ecosystem. And so there's a variety of different screening tools out there, but the tool I chose to examine was the Aquatic Species Invasiveness Screening Kit, or ASICS, as I will call it. And this is a risk assessment tool. It's been compiled of a couple other tools, and it may just streamline the process. And it's tailored specifically to marine, brackish, or freshwater species. Now, it's critical to test these risk assessments for validity in the specific research area to ensure proper and effective use. So the ASICS tool must be validated for the state of Hawaii before we can draw any data from it. And before we talk about validation, I'll talk a little bit about the ASICS tool itself. So the ASICS tool has 55 questions total. The first 49 are a basic risk assessment is what it's called. It covers biogeographical, historical, ethological traits. The last six are climate change assessment questions. And these questions are getting to the root of under future predicted climatic conditions, what would happen? And these are a little bit of extrapolation as well as using climate models and um, historical records to analyze what maybe the potential future environmental situations may be. So to fill these out, it's an extensive literature review and compilation of data entered into the system. It is converted from a qualitative 
citation justified answer. Um, you put that in the tool as well as you put a binary yes or no, higher or lower, and it spits out a score for us. The higher the score, the more likely the species is to be invasive. So these are the ranges for the BRA and the CCC respectively. Once you get numbers out of this, we can determine whether a species is low, medium, or high risk. These are the thresholds that are commonly used based on peer-reviewed and published papers. So low risk is going to be less than zero, medium is going to be at one to 18, and if it's a high risk for invasion, it's going to be over 19. Now that we know a little bit about the tool and how I used it, we're going to talk about how I validated it. So this is bringing together the data from the ARMS project and my interest in validating the tool. I kind of married them. And so I found two similar species on the ARMS device and chose to compare them for validation. So I chose a non-native mussel, Musculistus synhousia, or the Asian date mussel, Asian bag mussel, are the common names for it. It's extremely invasive and it's found all over the world. And I chose a native oyster, Pinctata margaritifera. It's the black-lipped pearl oyster. If you have beautiful Tahitian black pearls, they came from this oyster. And these were chosen to compare because they're both mollusks and they're both similar taxa. And one is obviously native and has been established in waters in Hawaii for a long period of time. And since we found um, our muscle on the arms device, we can show that it is in Hawaii and it is invading and we want to see the risk of invasion. So here are some of my results. So overall, just to look at it in general, my total scores, so the combined scores for both assessments, the um, muscle scored 48 and the oyster scored four. So you can see that the oyster did not score any points in the climate change category while the muscle scored 12. And you can see that the score for the BRA is much, much higher than it is for the oyster. Breaking this down a little bit more, into the BRA subsection scores. So talking about our invasive species on the left, our biogeographical historical score was 15 and our biology ecology score was 21. The muscle is already established globally, so it makes sense that it would have such a high invasive score. And the bulk of the score from this section comes from its global invasive presence and history of invasion. For the biology ecology section, the undesirable traits and resource exploitation section were the bulk of the points. By undesirable traits, it means um, it can reproduce quickly, things like that. This species scored as a high risk of invasiveness since it is above 19 and indicates that if it were populated in Hawaiian waters, it would be incredibly invasive. Looking on the right, we're talking about our native oyster. It scored a three in the biogeographical historical section. And this is where the bulk of the points originate from this one. I have a hypothesis that it originated from the domestic or the cultivation of these oysters, even though they are not cultivated for food and it is not common, they are cultivated for their pearls. And so that could potentially make the score go up higher. Talking about the climate change assessment, um, I got zero for our native oyster, and I got a score of 12 for invasive mussel. So this is meaning that under future climate conditions, which I predicted would be warmer, more stormy, the typical global warming, that the mussel would thrive as it's really adaptable to different climatic conditions and can tolerate warmer waters, and while the oyster would not thrive, which is why it has a score of zero, it would most likely perish under future climatic conditions or be pushed out by other species because it is not adaptable and it is not as easily reproductive as the mussel. So running these through, I obviously got a native score that is lower than my invasive score. And so therefore it would validate the tool for the state of Hawaii for marine invertebrates. My project scope was quite narrow as I, um, only had a couple years to do it, but if people were to further this research, it'd be extremely interesting to continue to validate this software for different marine invertebrates or even a variety of organisms. So overall, my project aimed to validate ASICs for the state of Hawaii, which it did as my native and non-native species were lower and higher respectively in the scores. And these scores reflect that ASICs is valid and can be used in Hawaii. Thank you everybody for listening. I wanna say thank you to 
Lizzie and Dr. Nelson for being my thesis advisors. I would not have been anywhere without them, as well as Julie Cleo and Natalie Dunn, who are my previous thesis advisors at DAR. I want to thank DAR and Bishop Museum and all my friends and family, my boyfriend, my family, my friends, and my beautiful boys I love to nanny. I love you all, and I'm really, really excited to share this with you. Please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, are there any questions? Hi, Ashley, I have a question. So what does this mean for like the future of Hawaii? So you said that you validated this tool. Have, are you talking to people like in Hawaii to like help them to, to see it and use it? Or what does this mean for the future? Thank you, Caitlin. So this means a couple things for the future. Number one, we have a tool now that we can use to allocate resources more effectively to manage these invasive species. So if we were to score multiple invasive species, we could see which one is the highest risk and prioritize that one. This also um, is a big deal because we can start using this around the world and have more of a database for our invasive species and build it with other communities that are also using this software. My personal thing, if I were to continue this research, I think outreach is a really important part of this. I think these scores and learning all this is really important, but communicating this to the public and decision makers, policy makers is really critical. So I think that needs to be the next step in this. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker will be introduced by Chris Schuler from the Water Resources Research Center. Thanks, Glenn. It's my pleasure to introduce Alyssa Renteria today. And I also wanna just acknowledge Mike Mazzacapo, who's also here, uh, who's a co-mentor throughout her project. So when Alyssa applied to be a research assistant on uh, Mike and I's Department of Health project, prioritized cesspool replacements, um, I knew from her resume that she had a really solid background with GIS, um, but little did I know just how skilled she is with these tools and uh, how skilled she is with using them to communicate and connect with people. Alyssa is super active in the student government here at UH. Uh, she joined the Associated Students of the uh, University of Hawaii as a senator, and she's now climbed the ladder to become the acting president of the ASUH. She also volunteers her limited time between her multiple jobs, classes, and research to mentor other students as GIS peer. And so for her thesis work, she developed a web viewer for the Hawaii Cesspool Prioritization Tool and explored the factors that determine the success of GIS web applications. We've been very happy to have Alyssa as a teammate on this project over the last couple of years, and I'm very excited to introduce her thesis work to you today. So Alyssa, the stage is yours. Big mahalo. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, my project is creating a framework for an effective GIS web application. So a little bit about the project, as Chris mentioned earlier, that this project is just a small piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, this is gonna be hopefully used in the future for DOH because they're trying to address the issue of cesspools in the state of Hawaii. So this project is covered with the cesspool conversion plan in Hawaii. There's about 88,000 cesspools in the state, which means it has the most per capita in the US. And a little bit about cesspools, they're open pits that allow for wastewater to leach into the surrounding environment. So, you know, homes, you go to the bathroom and then, you know, your waste goes out into say like the front yard or the backyard and it goes into the, this actual pit that just, lets it sit and then eventually it'll all flow out. And so if you know, you're driving some places and you notice like a funky smell and you're like, oh, what is that? You know, you feel like swimming or fishing. You're like, oh, I wonder what that is. There's potential um, pollution from the cesspools. And then, you know, the biggest problem with cesspools is that it allows for any pathogens or nitrates to contaminate our natural resources. And in Hawaii, right, they're very limited. So we wanna do our best to take care of them. And so in 2017, the state legislature recognized this huge issue and they required the upgrade, conversion and sewer connection of all cesspools in the state before 2050, unless exempted um, through the Hawaii Act 125. And so for this project, I had 
you know, two goals. I wanted to create a usable web app. And then I also wanted to learn more about usability. And for this project, we use Esri software and Google Forms. And so this is the actual web app. Um, you can, you know, check it out. And, you know, this is just like the homepage. So on the right hand side, you have two data sets. One is cesspools, the other one is census tracts, and they're ranked low, medium, high. And then in this left hand corner, you can search up your house and see, oh, you know, do I have a cesspool? How is it ranked? And just kind of see, you know, what the neighborhood is like. And then this is just another um, example, you know, the different variations, right? Why one all of each area tends to have a high rank priority ranking, while this area has a lower priority ranking. And so in my project, I had a couple of different methods, but, you know, split between qualitative observations, survey, and simulations. The bulk of this project, however, was evaluated through the survey. And there was four sections, but only three required um, input from the participants, which was demographic questions, tasks, and post-task questions. And all the participants were anonymous. We had 16 of them. And they could access the web app through any device they wanted. And this was our participant profile. So everybody had some experience with GIS. GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. And so I'm sure some people, they might not know they have experience with GIS, but say you're using Google Maps or Apple Maps, you already have a little bit of experience. And so everybody, it was more so split. And I thought that was very interesting. And we got kind of lucky that our participants uh, all have spent so much time living in Hawaii because this web app is going to be mostly used by Hawaii residents. And then also, um, it seems that our participants had a lower range of knowledge about cesspools in general. So it was great to see if they felt that there was an increase in knowledge. And so we're going to section three of the survey. And so this basically has the task where students or participants um, were given a task and then they had some answer options. And in the first two, they had to basically find an area and then correctly categorize what the area was between low, medium, high. The third one, they had to manipulate the data a little bit. So turn off one of the data sets and see if they could share it, you know, through the print function. And then the fourth section um, was going to another different area, actually Maui. And then, you know, just trying to see, we wanted to have their own ideas of the connections they were making. And then to also see if they could make the connection that, you know, a lower priority ranking um, correlates with a lower impact on the health of the human environment based off three towns that have each unique rankings. And so here are our results from that. The first two tasks were great. Everybody got it correct. And so that definitely helped, you know, make sure that we felt comfortable that everybody was able to do those. Um, the next three, we had majority of people able to complete it. Um, we started to see a pattern of where folks weren't quite making that connection sometimes that, you know, the priority ranking is equal to, or is very similar to the impact on human health. And then our fourth section of the survey was just, you know, getting them to rate how they felt about the web app itself. And then, you know, was it actually easy to do? So we asked them, you know, could you rate it like, how easy it was, intuitiveness, and usefulness. And generally, folks had a positive response, which was great. And then another, you know, section that we had asked people about was just like, what are things that we could improve on, right? Because there's always things that we're missing, you know, we always want to fine tune things. And so we had more free response. And from the user comments, um, it was great because they sort of confirmed what we were starting to think, which was that 
there needs to be more information on you know the rankings themselves as people come into the web app actually there's a splash page that does explain the low medium and high system but folks usually you know they'll read it and then they'll close it but then there's no way for them to go back and so what we were going to do next was actually add an about section so they could always go back to that page and reread the information. And then even though people, majority of people have, you know, great experience with living in Hawaii, um, they even pointed out some things that were more thoughtful for folks that don't live in Hawaii. And so they noticed that the points on the map should go underneath the names of certain towns like Haleiwa, Diamond Head. And then overall, you know, they like the app, just a little bit more description. And so some of the challenges in this project were predicting whether or not users would be able to understand the data, right? We can do only so much, but in the end, um, we learned that human feedback is incredibly useful. And even if you're unable to get like this large scale, right? We're only a small team, but if you reach out to a few, like your colleagues or your peers, you're bound to learn and definitely improve on your um, on your tool. And then also another challenge was just finding ways to customize the app to fit our needs. You know, originally we had the two data sets in one category, but in the end we decided to split them up. And so we had to find a way to do that. And then a great thing that we learned was that to not lead, to not let simplifying lead to limiting available information, it was very encouraging to see folks asking for more information. They wanted to know even more than what we had. And so one of the great things is that this tool is gonna to be a part of a website that will have more information. And so it'll give them the tools to you know, reach out to like actual departments and hopefully get funding so they can easily convert their cesspools. And so in conclusion, the best user experience practices enabled us to actually create a usable web app and that human feedback is incredibly valuable. So once we've modified the feedback, we're gonna be left with an even better app. And in sometime July, I believe, we're gonna have our press release of this. So I really hope you all are able to visit the site. And so I would just like to acknowledge, you know, my GS peers, my co-advisors, Chris and Mike, my family, my friends, faculty support and my mentors, as well as um, Caitlin Quinn, two other interns I worked with, DOH Wastewater Branch, Successful Working Group, and I survey participants. It would have been you know, possible to do this without you. So thank you. And before I take any questions, I'd also just like to acknowledge um, Hawaii is an indigenous space and would like to further recognize the generations of the Kanaka Oivi for taking care of Aina and allowing us to enjoy her gifts today. Thank you. Great job. Good job. Does anybody have a question for Alyssa? Yep. Hi. Um, yes, I have a question. <laughs> uh, sorry. So I was just wondering for Alyssa, is the cesspool data current or is it left over from original construction? Yes, it was taken um, in 2010. Okay, then Keanu has a question too. Okay. So I heard that there's two um, sewage system in Hawaii, the septic tanks and the cesspools. Uh, what is the difference and how do they compare in terms of um, impact on the environment? The difference is how more so how secure cesspool you actively um, let it leach into the environment. The septic tank is more of a closed system. And Megan has a question. I was wondering how long it took you to actually develop the web app. Great question. It took about uh, six months. So researching, you know, how to what are the best options and you know, actually putting into, you know, a real actual web app. We had to do the custom version, so the developer edition of Web App Builder. And then from there, it took about six months for the testing.
Great, thank you. Our next presenter uh, is Marsha Rutenberg. Uh, her advisor is unable to be on the call today, so I will say a few words. Uh, so Marsha grew up in the metropolitan area of New Jersey. She moved to Hawaii about six years ago and has become fascinated with the ocean. In summer 2020, she began interning with a PhD candidate, uh, Devin Jolshan, um, sorry, um, you can correct his name, um, at the Coral Nursery at uh, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And through that, uh, she was able to develop a thesis subject and worked alongside uh, Dr. Joseph Madden, a coral expert, who has given her methods and materials to dive into qualitative analysis of coral uh, ecology. So, Marsha, uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, okay. All right. So, aloha. My name is Marsha Rutenberg, and today I'm presenting my GES thesis entitled The Negligible Effect on Density on Coral Survivorship and the Implications It Has for Reef Restoration. Prior to me discussing my uh, motivation behind my thesis, I'd like to point out the difference between the words restoration and rehabilitation. Restoration is an attempt to restore an ecosystem that has been severely damaged back to its original state. However, rehabilitation is an attempt to repair damage but not return to its original state. If you look to the right, you'll notice an infographic created by NOAA that carefully outlines a six-step process for coral reef restoration, planning, and design. If you notice, there is limited consideration for population density and the potential effect it can have. I believe that not considering density dependence as a significant variable in coral restoration efforts is a flaw because it does have the potential to dictate population, mortality, recruitment, and growth. Globally, efforts to restore and improve coral communities vary significantly. And one of these ways includes raising coral in a coral nursery, and nurseries differ. Reef managers can choose to raise coral in a high dense nursery like this one at HANB, or in a sparse nursery like this one in Belize. In these nurseries, Reef managers can observe changes in pH levels, community structure, presence of predators, sunlight availability, and sea surface temperatures. And with such a difference in methodology, my overarching question is, what are the optimal density conditions that influence growth, survivorship, and fecundity? Before I dive deep into the nitty gritty of my thesis, here is an outline of what to expect. My thesis is twofold. The first part will highlight my findings from an eight-year demographic study, and the second part will focus on the meta-analysis I performed. I will begin with the eight-year demographic study. This study was conducted off the coast of Lizard Island in the Great Barrier Reef. Over the course of eight years, 350, corals, co excuse me, 350 coral colonies were observed from 11 different species pertaining to five different morpholo morphology types, tabular, corombrose, digitate, massive, and branching. And from the raw data of the study, I was able to run my own statistics and results. In front of you is a graph that demonstrates the effects of colony planar area on the survival of different coral morphologies. The x-axis is the colony planar area in log form, and the y-axis is the survival probability. I'd like to focus your attention on two specific morphology forms. We can see that as tabular coral structures increase in size, their survival probability decreases. However, as massive coral structures increase, their survival probability will increase as well. This can be explained by the mechanical vulnerability of specific morphology and size classes. Tabular corals will experience mortality as they get larger due to their top heavy form. This led me to ask, does density influence different morphologies? Here is a graph that describes the effects of crowding on the survival of different coral morphologies. The x-axis is crowding and the y-axis is survival. What is something that stands out? Well, this specific study did not explicitly study density. Thus, we use crowding as a proxy for density. And we can notice from this graph that as crowding increases, survival hardly changes. We unexpectedly find that mortality is not influenced by density. I do want to point out that density does matter, but not as sig significantly as other coral properly, properties. This led me to ask, is this relationship seen elsewhere? And to answer that, I performed a meta-analysis. 
For my meta-analysis, I focused on the area highlighted in the red circle. The blue circle encompasses the region where I was able to find all relevant publications. However, due to uncomparable data, I, I had to limit my region to just the red circle. To conduct my meta-analysis, I followed the PICO protocol established by Lillian Tattle and Eileen Nally. This method allowed me to set and follow a strict guideline in order to find an appropriate literature from databases that would allow me to complete my meta-analysis. Following this setup, I outlined parameters for population, exposure, comparison, and outcome. I also had a defining question that would allow me to screen papers for relevance. What are the responses associated with change in coral population density? And then four sub-questions. Do these responses differ by taxa or coral morphology? Do the responses differ by life histories? Do the responses differ over time? And do the responses differ by geographical location? To do so, here is a flowchart of my methodology for my meta-analysis. I first developed search terms, and then I applied those search terms through a database. I filtered results by abstract relevance. I then filtered abstracts by relevant papers, and I fully read those papers. I extracted data from relevant papers, and then I combined data and analyzed like responses in a quantitative meta-analysis, a qualitative review, and a description of missing information. Please take a look at number two. I want to explain that I only had I only had the chance to use one database for this meta-analysis. I attempted to use multiple databases, but after inputting one search term, I came across over 10,000 results. And here's a table that showcases all of the search terms that I inputted into Google Scholar. This right here is a flowchart of my generated results. There were 59 total papers gathered from, school, from Google Scholar and 14 out of those papers were relevant. Unfortunately, due to insufficient data, I was only able to focus on the effects of density on survivorship. And here are the results from, my gen from the extracted data. The graph on the left describes the effect of coral population density on colonial survival. The x-axis is population density and the y-axis is survival. In this graph, we notice that the line of best fit appears to have a slight positive slope and two clusters are seen at the lowest population density and the average amount of colonies per meter squared. The graph on the right is a scatter plot depicting the effects of density on the mortality of corals. The x-axis relates to the population density and the y-axis relates to the adjusted partial mortality. Data for this graph was adjusted to remove an outlier due to a different collection method from a specific study. The positive slope on this graph indicates that as density increases, so does potential, excuse me, so does partial tissue mortality. But both, gra both graphs exhibit a lack of significance to draw any conclusions and correlations. But why can we not draw any conclusions and correlations? Well, the biggest reason as to why I could not draw any conclusions was due to the lack of available comparable data. If you look at the columns, where the arrows are pointing, you'll notice the response types, the units, and the durations differ. Additionally, I was only able to focus on one species, Acropora severcornis. And lastly, it was quite evident that density measurements vary too drastically to form any comparisons on density-dependent relationships. In fact, we noticed that coral population density is a neglected parameter, and coral cover is the popular metric chosen to, con to quantify the coral colonies present. By using coral cover as a measure of density, it leads to a bias because coral cover is not a dependable parameter, since a true distinction between a single large coral colony and many small, smaller coral colonies could not be made. Therefore, in order to obtain an accurate result and draw conclusions, population measurements need to become standardized. New standard data collection methods need to be implemented into studies <clears throat> to further get accurate results. And then to conclude, I'd like for you to accept some final remarks. The biggest takeaway from my thesis is that any other processes are more important for coral survival, survival than density. Density dependence does, not co does come into play, but it is outweighed by other processes such as mechanical vulnerability and size class. With that being said, there is no clear relationship between, de between adult coral, excuse me, there is no clear relationship between adult colony survival and population density. Density dependence might truly only affect smaller size classes of coral rather than adult coral, and further coral collection efforts need to evaluate how, evaluate how to report population. We argue that there are potential factors not considered in regard to the relationship between coral demographics and density. 
We encourage coral reef scientists to incorporate a measure of population density in addition to coral cover to establish a more standard process that will allow a comp comprehensible analysis of density dependent relationships. Thank you so much. I'd like to acknowledge my wonderful mentors, Dr. Joshua Maiden and Devin Wolstein, as well as the great GESP professors and my peers. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any You're questions? Welcome. Hi, um, I have a question. I was wondering just if you could go back and do it again, would you change anything about your project? Uh, yeah, actually, great question. Um, I think that knowing what I know now, instead of looking at density dependence in coral communities, I would like to see like if I can see it in smaller size classes and then completely ignore um, coral morphologies or maybe even ignore density and just strictly look at coral morphologies um, on a global scale. Thank you for your question. Okay, we have one in the chat from Hannah. Do you want to uh, say your question out loud? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. So aside from what you already mentioned, uh, how else do you hope this research will influence the coral community? Thank you for your question. Um, I honestly hope that reef managers and coral reef scientists will conduct another meta-analysis. I had a significant time constraint and I also didn't truly perform a true meta-analysis because I only did use one uh, database. Um, I do encourage scientists to continue and use, to continue this research and use the same methodology um, and perhaps apply it to uh, multiple databases and hopefully our results will become more conclusive. And one from Lori. Hi, Masha. Sorry, I have my video off, but uh, great job again on the presentation. And I was just Thank wondering you. about, um, yeah, um, and I noticed <laughs> for the meta analysis, right, you're focusing on one species. And I was wondering if you, you if you yourself are the big species that are more sensitive to density dependence and, um, I don't know, not necessarily just related to coral survivorship, but successful coral restoration. So also health of the coral. Um, so I guess that's a bit separate, but another thought being, uh, I guess, so why what might density be more important for other species than others? And I guess I'm kind of teasing the idea of the importance of the, the symbionts, right? So my idea is density would be important because you have perhaps more diversity in right between the kind of algal symbionts, the bacterial symbionts that they could be having. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so you kind of cut off, uh, cut off about one third of the way into your question. So I just wanna make sure that I understand your question. You want, actually, can you repeat your question? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. There were kind of two points in there. Sorry. So are there, um, do you believe that there's other species that are more sensitive to density dependence okay. coming from a coral restoration background and all the research? That's kind of the first question. And the second one okay. is, do you believe density dependence is more, in, or sorry, density in coral restoration is more important because it would bring a variety of potential symbionts, or I guess genetic diversity, and the, I guess in the gene pool of like symbiodinium and all the other other symbiotic relationships they might have, or yeah. Okay, awesome. All right. So to answer your first question, um, I don't. I can't. I don't know if other species are more tolerant of tolerant of density, um, of high dense uh, living environments or low dense living environments. Um, 
because my research was very limited to just Acropora severicornis, um, I would be very interested to find that out. And I do think that's where the research should be going towards. Um, and I don't think that one, uh, one answer fits all. Um, and that's why I think it's very important to stress this out. And your follow-up question, if I'm understanding it correctly, um, I think it, I think it is important to study density dependence because it's it's a very neglected topic in coral uh, restoration efforts, and to mitigate it, and to mitigate uh, restoration efforts faster because coral will become um, significantly endangered by 2050. All aspects of restoration needs to be addressed. I hope Thanks, I answered Yasha. that correctly. I'm so sorry yeah, if I did no, not. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize that I should probably have just gone one at a time. But yeah, it was, it was kind of like, why is density something we should be looking closer at? And as you mentioned, it's a more neglected factor in coral restoration. And in my head, coming from a genetic background, I'm thinking about the gene pool of uh, all the, you know, the micro potential microbiomes there. For sure. And yeah, one answer doesn't really apply to all. Um, this strictly just applies to the Acropora severicornis that I saw. Um, but most importantly is that density doesn't really affect survivorship as much as uh, morphotypes does. However, we only saw that in adult corals. I think it'd be very interesting to continue this research and see it more in fragments and potentially juvenile corals. Okay, um, thank you. We'll have to move on, but uh, can um, Marsha can hopefully stay on a little afterwards and answer any more questions. So introducing our final speaker for today's symposia is uh, Dan Miltz, Dr. Dan Miltz from Urban and Regional Planning. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. It really is uh, truly a pleasure to be able to introduce this um, final speaker today. Um, so I've known Jakob for uh, a couple of years now. He was uh, originally a student in uh, my intro to urban planning class a couple of years ago during the height of the pandemic. And at the end of that class, Jakob came to me with some ideas about wanting to do uh, some research. And so over the last uh, couple of uh, couple of years, Jakob and I have been working on uh, these ideas that he's had about uh, water and one water and how to implement uh, policy and, and governance changes to improve water management here on Oahu. I say all that uh, and and uh, and also in the back of my mind, I have to keep in uh, keep in mind that um, while he's doing that, while he's uh, um, uh, managing his courses, Jakob is also uh, a member of the men's volleyball team, uh, which won a national championship last year and is uh, teed up to defend their title tomorrow night in uh, Los Angeles. This year, Jakob was also the player of the year for the, the Big West Conference, as well as the uh, conference champion <laughs> conference tournament championship MVP. Um, so he's an all around great student, uh, an all around uh, really strong developing researcher uh, and a star on the volleyball court. And he's joining us here uh, from UCLA by way of, uh, of Norway, uh, I, I might add. Uh, so there's, there's no end to the, to, the, to the great things that I could say about Jakob. And uh, we are really looking forward to having him join us next year in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning as one of our master's students. So I'll stop there because I could go on. Um, Jakob, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, Dan. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so thank you for saying it all the way to the end. Um, my name is Jakob Tellet, and I will be presenting my senior thesis in GES, which I practically dove into water management together with my mentor, Dr. Dan Ellis, in the Department of Urban Regional Planning. And my name, my title, my thesis, Olai Kavai, the barriers of implementing a one water approach on Oahu. So just to provide some brief introduction on this thesis work that I did, um, we are heading towards an emerging water crisis and we are over consuming water, we are polluting the waters and we also have climate change that are producing lots of challenges to how we manage our waters, both in terms of water quality, but also water quantity. So specifically in Hawaii, we're seeing detrimental impacts to water resources in the form of flooding, sea level rise, um, extreme weather events and also decreasing rainfall in the Hawaiian Islands that are producing cha um, changes to the water cycle. And there's also some challenges of how we are governing the water resource that we have. 
So there are some, by this time, institutional and bureaucratic water governance challenges. And I will go into more of this in detail later, but these are silos that are going into how we are managing water in a more isolated fashion. So to deal with all these challenges, posting water resources, we have um, the proposed solution, which is the one water cycle. And this is different from the conventional water management by how it's taken a more holistic approach to managing water resources. So instead of thinking of water in the form of drinking water, salt water, fresh water, gray water, um, as the list goes on, we're looking at just looking at um, managing water in a more integrated fashion. So taking all these sorts of water and seeing how its uses can be, um, how there's different efficiencies in the water system. So in the figure, we can see how there's different use of water, industrial, commercial, and how there's uh, potential for collaborating across sectors, across disciplines to manage water in a more efficient manner. And this is something that the state of Hawaii is trying to implement, more specifically in the city kind of Honolulu. So just taking a quick look, we have the water management system in Oahu. And by just taking a brief look at this, we can see there's a lot of complexity that goes into the system. There's different agencies, different water governance bodies that are attempting to manage water resources. Um, and it's a whole, um, a lot of mess. There's a lot of disjointed disconnections in the system. And the way that one water is trying to alleviate some of these um, silos are through having a one water panel. So even though the whole system is still very complex, one water is not trying to break all these, um, this poor management style and yeah, um, encourage more collaboration across sectors and disciplines. And still it is looking quite like a complex system. So the main research questions that my thesis work focus on where um, I had three key questions that I wanted to kind of answer in my thesis work. And first off, how do stakeholders learn to recognize the value of one water? Second, how does one water fit into the pre-existing water management system? And lastly, what are the barriers to implementing one water on Oahu? So for my methods, um, this thesis work is distinguished from the conventional um, scientific research through hypothesis testing and data collection by having a more qualitative research design. So I did a total of 10 interviews, interviewing stakeholders and professional water managers across the public, private and nonprofit sector. Um, they lasted for about 30 to 50 minutes. And the questions they focused on the stakeholders, professional background and also experience with one water. And the interviews were all audio recorded and transcribed. And for data analysis, I did a qualitative textual interpretation so I did close reading of all the transcripts. I documented consistent themes across all transcripts, not only one, two, three, but across all 10 of the interviews that I did, I documented what was consistent and what are some common themes that I can draw from my analysis. And last, I also compared all these uh, themes across the different aspects of the transcripts. For my findings, I was able to draft um, four key um, barriers to implementing one water. First was seeing solid systems, second, funding of budget constraints, third, social cultural understanding, and fourth, political and social buy-in that I'm going to talk, briefly talk about here and this part of my presentation. So first off, solid system, it refers to how there is um, a tunnel vision to water management, how water is being managed individually and not um, integrated. So just to draw a quote from this, we have at the city level to a certain degree, here we go. At the city level, to a certain degree, water management agencies do not, they operate themselves in separate silos and do not think of themselves as integrated. The second main barrier to one water implementation is um, funding and budget constraints. And by this, usually to implement new plans and projects, funding and budget always comes up as a challenge. And the same is the case for one water. So a quote from this is to help leverage these projects in the public or private sector they just can't quite fund it, even though the overall benefit to society would be tremendous. The third barrier is social culture understanding. And this goes into how uh, water has such a unique meaning in the Hawaiian Islands. And by this, the Hopua system, which is the most, um, the first conventional water management um, approach, taking the Makatu Makai approach and looking at the interconnectedness of water. So draw to, to draw a quote from this, we have, that there's history in Hawaii of water being take, taken away from the people and native uses and moved to support the economic benefit of the few. There is an elephant in the room that is still there. And the last barrier is political 
and social buy-in. And this refers to how decision makers, but also how the social and how the public is viewing water and specifically how to come to understand the value of warm water. So a quote from here is that it being water management has limited resources and the way people think about climate change reflects that there's a mindset issue. We think of it as a problem of tomorrow. So overall, we have these four key barriers to implementing on water, and these all have um, significant implications for the scale of planning and integrated climate science into water management. So a couple of points for my conclusions. First is the value of water. Um, the emphasis of my work shows that there is water is being undervalued, and we can arguably say that water is the most important resource that we have, and seeing how the public and how decision makers are um, prioritizing funding for warm water, that there is a lack of, of valuing water in general. The second is that warm water might um, resolve the silos and also it might enhance them. And by this, um, stakeholders have expressed how water can, um, warm water can alleviate some of these silos, but it can also promote more um, complexity. And by this, it can enhance the, the silos and it can also be viewed as another um, effort to sustain Hawaii's waters, which will take a lot more time and a lot more commitment for um, planners and professional water managers. Next, we have that one water can be used to reevaluate the water management system. And by this, um, one water is already trying to be or encouraging systemic change into the whole um, water management infrastructure. So now either we can see that one water can be um, sufficiently and efficiently integrated into the water management system, but it can also produce some difficulties. And by this, we have the theoretical and practical implications. And again, theoretical goes into how water is being um, looked at being implemented into the whole water management system, while practical go into how the behavior and professional background and professional workspaces of the water managers have to change. So both in terms of time commitment and just how overall agencies and cross disciplines work together towards managing waters in Hawaii. And last point that I want to draw out is that water is a public choice in Hawaii. Um, it's the people of Hawaii who owns Hawaii's waters, even though there's been Western influence of um, water resources, there's still, um, there's still that water is being a public trust by how uh, the people, they have, um, they have a demand for access to clean, access to enough water in Hawaii. And that can also be um, a challenge for warm water. And just to provide a couple steps for overcoming the barriers, we have first the role of education. So a lot of the interviews that have expressed how the root of the issue is in the education system and how there's a lack of um, water, um, water being taught in classes and how this can be used to provide more system thinking by thinking of water in the whole system, not just by being as something we drink, something we use for our different uses, but something that is really important to everybody. And by this, we can bridge gaps and skills and expertise to create more unified vision, both for the public, but also for professional water managers um, across agencies and across sectors, which is a really important point. The next one is the spreading of awareness. And by this, um, kuleana, which is native Hawaiian term for responsibility. So understanding your own responsibility towards managing or towards your use of water resources, but also how, what is your um, individual role in that part and that goal, but also how, what is your collective and collective decision-making going to contribute towards um, managing wise water for the future and develop climate resiliency. For acknowledgements, I want to give a huge thanks to the Department of Oceanography and GES program. Um, I also want to give a large thanks to my thesis mentor, Dan Mills, for guiding me through this research project. Um, and also all the, last but not least, all the participants contributing to the research study. And that concludes my presentation and I will open up for questions. Thank you. Great job. Any questions for Jacob?
Okay, in that case, um, at 3.30, for those of you on campus, there will be a reception in the lanai of uh, the Marine Sciences Building. Uh, so you can meet with most of the speakers for today, uh, graduates for the last couple of years that were, you know, uh, we didn't get to do a face-to-face -face with because of the pandemic. And that will start at 3.30. So if there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to invite you all to thank all our very interesting speakers today and the various people across campus and across the state that have mentored them in their exciting projects. Okay. Thank you for all for coming. <laughs>